On the desk for review today, I have the Razer Blade 16, a very premium laptop with some very, very juicy specs. Let's dive in and find out if it's any good, shall we? Hi guys, welcome to Kit Guru. I'm Matt, and this is my full review of the Razer Blade 16. Now, before we dive into the specifics of this model that I've got for review, I'm trying to go through the options you can pick when you choose to order one of these things. So this laptop can be tweaked to include up to an RTX 4090 graphics card, a one or two terabyte SSD, 16 or 32 gig of DDR5 memory, and then there are two different screen options, a 2560 by 1600 240 hertz Quad HD plus option, or then there's a mini LED dual mode display, which can run at both 240 hertz at 1920 by 1200, and then at 120 hertz at 3840 by 2400. So basically 1080p and 4K, but just with a 16 by 10 aspect ratio. All variations of this laptop come with an Intel Core i9-13950HX CPU. Now, as for this specific model and the one that I'm going to be reviewing today, it's got the following specs. Obviously, it's got that Core i9-13950HX CPU, which is present in all of the models. This one's got an RTX 4080 laptop GPU. It's got 32 gig of memory. It's got a one terabyte SSD. And then the screen on this one is the Quad HD Plus 2560 by 1200 240 hertz display. The price for this configuration of this laptop is an absolutely eye-watering £3,600. That's, that's quite substantial. So this thing has got to perform for me to be recommending it at that price point. So let's look at the specs in a bit more detail before moving on to look at the design, the build quality, and then finally how this thing performed through our benchmarks. So firstly, that CPU then, as I mentioned it a couple of times, is the Intel Core i9-13950HX. It's got 24 cores and 32 threads. And those cores consist of eight performance cores, which are capable of boosting up to 5.5 gigahertz, and then 16 efficiency cores, which they're capable of boosting up to four gigahertz. And then it runs at 55 watts base power, but is capable of going up to 157 watts max turbo power. Powering the graphics inside this laptop is the NVIDIA RTX 4080 laptop GPU. It's got 12 gig of GDDR6X memory. It runs at a base clock of 1,290 megahertz, and then it boosts up to 1,665 megahertz, and that's running at 110 watts TDP. Memory comes in at 32 gig of DDR5 memory, running at 5,600 mega transfers. The, that's the maximum speed that the CPU in this computer officially supports. There are only two DIMM slots on the board, and they're both occupied by that memory, so changing or upgrading in the future would require you to buy a whole new kit. You've got no room for expansion there. And as for storage, Razer kind of went down the Apple route, and they don't actually state what SSD is in the Razer Blade 16. It's listed as an M.2 NVMe PCI Express 4 drive, but there's no word on manufacturer or model. But that's no worries because I've got plenty of screwdrivers and a, a bit of curiosity. So a little digging reveals that it's a CA68D1024 from SSSTC or Solid State Storage Technology Corporation. They're part of Kioxia and they're formerly known as Lighton. As for the drive in this machine though, it's a one terabyte model and a quick test of crystal disk mark shows that the read speeds get to almost 6,900 megabytes per second and write speeds come in a little bit lower at 4,822 megabytes per second. There is an extra M.2 port though available if you want to bump up the total storage a bit, that wouldn't be no issue, you just got to get a drive and stick it in there. And like the memory where you'd have to change all of it, you've got no room, you have room to expand the storage. And the display then, out of the two options available for the Blade 16, this one has the 16 inch 2560 by 1600 240 hertz Quad HD Plus panel. 
It's got a max brightness of 500 nits and then a sub three millisecond response time. And finally, talking about the battery, which I think is one of the most important things when you're choosing a laptop, because that's what makes it a laptop. You want to use it out and about. The battery in this thing is a 95.2 watt hour non-removable cell which is charged with a 330 watt GAN charger, which you get in the box. It does charge quite quickly during my usage and test. I haven't benchmarked that, but it does charge quite noticeably quickly. Uh, and we'll see how long that battery lasts through a benchmark test later on in the video. Before we move on to talk about benchmarking, testing and performance then, let's look at the design and the build quality. When I first unboxed this laptop, I was immediately impressed with how it feels and looks. The chassis is made entirely of anodized aluminium and it feels very, very, very premium. The finish is soft and smooth to the touch and everything's just machined excellently and fits together well. It is a bit of a fingerprint magnet in places, but that's nothing a bit of a wipe with a, a microfiber cloth can't fix. The keyboard's pretty standard stuff. It's got perky RGB customization and N key rollover. The lighting on that keyboard, in my opinion, looks really good. It's bright and uniform, and I can hardly see any patchiness at all. The tiny cluster of arrow keys are very fiddly to use to begin with, but I did get used to them quite quickly. There's no numpad or page up and down or secondary function keys on the keyboard, as the quite generous amount of space at either side of that keyboard is taken up by the speakers, which I'll talk about in a moment. The trackpad is huge, and for the most part, feels pretty good. Clicks feel great across most of the surface area, but it does travel quite a bit more near the bottom edge when compared to the top edge. And if you try and click it right along the very top edge, just underneath the space bar, then it won't click down at all. I have encountered a few accidental clicks when using this laptop during my testing, mainly because that trackpad's so massive and possibly because I'm more of a desktop PC user at heart. I don't use laptops all that often, uh, mainly for when I'm doing my videos and testing and the occasional out and about trip for work and stuff like that. But I have caught it with my palm in my hand a few times and it does get a little bit annoying. It takes a little bit of getting used to it. It's like a whole section top to bottom of that panel underneath the keyboard is taken up by the huge trackpad, so that's something to watch out for. Along with the keyboard being fully RGB backlit and customizable, there's also a backlit Razer logo on the top case, but the customization there is limited just to either a static or breathing green light, keeping in tone with the Razer branding. You definitely can tell this is a Razer laptop from a mile away. The hinges, along with the rest of the laptop, feel very well made and sturdy. They don't automatically close and you can set the screen at whatever angle you want it to be at which is a nice touch and through the whole range of motion it feels smooth and solid. The bezels around the screen are relatively thin. The top one's slightly thicker as it houses the webcam which is 1080p. It's never going to win any awards but it should do you for meetings and stuff though. I'll drop a little clip over the top of me talking about it now of just some b-roll so you can see the quality you can expect to see from the webcam. For connectivity you get one Thunderbolt 4 USB-C port, one USB-C 3.2 Gen 2 port, three USB-A 3.2 Gen 2 ports, a HDMI 2.1 connection and then an SD card reader. And the speakers that I alluded to earlier, for audio, the Razer Blade 16 has four speakers in total. There are the two that are mentioned on either side of the keyboard, and then there are another two on the bottom of the laptop. The sound that this laptop kicks out is impressive for a laptop, for laptop speakers that usually sound quite tinny. These impressed me, they're loud and crisp. Here's a quick clip of an audio recording so you can hear what they sound like. YouTube will have compressed the audio a bit, but you'll get the idea of the fullness of the sound. So that audio sounds pretty good, right? Let us know in the comments what you think of it. But talking about thermals and cooling, the Razer Blade 16 features vapor chamber cooling, which gets rid of heat via the evaporation and then condensation of fluid inside the cooling system. Some mobile phones call themselves using this same method, but there's a big, 
big difference in power and in turn heat when you go from trying to call the, the chip found in a mobile phone to an, a high-end Intel laptop processor. And the Core i9-13950HX found inside the Razer Blade 16 is just too much for the cooling of this laptop to handle, at least on this specific unit that I've got here anyway. During my testing, I saw thermal throttling triggering on multiple P cores when testing in Cyberpunk 2077 and Cinebench. And this is with the laptop in both the custom profile with the CPU set to either boost or high and also in the balanced profile. With the custom profile active in Synapse and the CPU set to boost, up to six of the eight P cores dipped as low as 798 MHz at times, which was more than likely the reason that we saw reduced scores in Cinebench multi-core, which you'll see when I go to the benchmarking charts in a moment, which left this machine falling short of the scores achieved by the Core i9-13900HX found in the Recoil 17R LC from PC Specialist that I reviewed recently, and the Comparison figures are with that laptop air-cooled, not with its liquid cooler attached. Switching to the balanced profile reduces the power limits on the CPU, which should in turn produce less heat, which is only marginally true. It wasn't enough to stop the processor throttling to prevent it cooking itself to death. Again, some P cores were observed dipping down to 798 MHz. As I mentioned, those profiles adjust the power limits applied to that CPU and you change them in Synapse, with balanced applying a 55 watt limit to both PL1 and PL2, while the custom profile applies a 110 watt PL1 limit and a 130 watt PL2 limit. I observed throttling on this laptop after just one to two minutes of running tests in Cyberpunk and Cinebench. And while the data you're about to see in the charts was all recorded with this fan speed set to auto, switching that fan speed to max only slightly helped and didn't prevent drastic core clock speed dips. This was very disappointing to see and it held the performance of the Razer Blade 16 and the processor itself back by quite a lot. So with that in mind, let's move into the benchmarks. The system I used to compare against the Blade 16 was the Recoil 17 RLC laptop from PC Specialist being cooled with air rather than liquid. The specs are very similar in that machine, with the only real major difference being the CPU and the memory speed. The Recoil 17 contains the Intel Core i9-13900HX and the memory speed was 4,800 mega transfers. So I'm gonna run through the benchmark charts quite quickly as we've got a lot to get through. I tested the Razer Blade 16 through every benchmark in both its balanced and its custom profile. In the custom profile, I had the CPU set to boost and the GPU set to maximum. I had both options set to the highest they would go. And then in balanced, there is no option for that. It's just balanced. And fan speed was auto throughout all of the tests. So kicking things off with Blender then and the Razer Blade 16 in its custom profile finished the test in 222 seconds on average while that figure jumped up to 358 seconds on average when using the balanced profile. Moving into Cinebench and on the custom profile in multi-core we saw a score of 25,635 and then in single core with that custom profile we saw a score of 2,007. And then moving over to the balanced profile, saw the multi-core score drop to 16,859, but surprisingly the single core performance increased very, very marginally by 10 points to 2017. And this is probably the first indicator we've got of the thermal throttling that's occurring when you compare the scores to the comparison system. Moving into 3D Mark Times by then, and we can see scores on the custom profile of 15,061 points on the CPU and 18,490 points on the GPU. While in balance, those scores dropped down to 10,756 points for the CPU and 17,619 points for the GPU. In Ada then, checking the memory read and write speeds, in the custom profile, we saw read speeds of 86,109 megabytes per second, while the write speeds were a bit below that at 72,253. 
While in balance, the results were fairly similar, with the read speeds coming in at 84,735 megabytes per second, and those write speeds at 72,711 megabytes per second. And PC Mark 10 then, the penultimate of our synthetic benchmarks. In the custom profile, we saw scores in the overall category of 7,604, 10,295 in essentials, 10,830 for productivity, and 10,703 for content creation. And then flipping to the balance profile, saw an overall score of 7,426. The essential score was 10,280, 11,032 for productivity, which surprisingly went up over the custom profile. And then for content creation, we saw 9,802. And finally, the battery life test then, which is our, the last of our kind of synthetic system tests before we move on to gaming. This laptop achieved 344 minutes with its 95.2 watt hour battery. That was with roughly 50% screen brightness. And I only tested this one in the balance profile as custom is not available when running on battery power. So heading into the gaming benchmarks, we can definitely see something weird going on. And the thermal throttling that was observed is definitely holding back this CPU within this system specifically. Let's move into gaming benchmarks and see how that affected things. So kicking things off with Call of Duty and on the custom profile, we saw an average frame rate of 109.7 with a 55.51% low. While in balanced, we saw those figures drop down to 98.7 average FPS and 44.7 1% low. Moving into The Witcher 3 then, and on the custom profile, we saw an average frame rate of 65.6 .6 with a 42.1 1% low. While in balance, that dropped down to 55.7 average FPS and 42.31% low. Moving into Shadow of the Tomb Raider then, and on the custom profile, we saw a 136.7 average FPS with a 77.1% low. While in balance, that goes down to 123 average FPS with an 82.71% low. I'm just jumping in quickly to say there's a bit of a pattern emerging already with the 1% lows. They seem to be a bit higher in the balanced profile on this laptop, which is an indicator that the thermal throttling being more intense and frequent across more of the cores of the P cores of the processor in the custom profile is hindering the performance. Let's move on. So Hogwarts Legacy then, and on the custom profile, we saw a 73.3 average FPS with a 38.71% 1% low. Balance profile saw that drop down on average to 70.7, but then the 1% low went up slightly to 40.3. Company of Heroes 3 then, and on the custom profile, we saw 136.7 average FPS with an 80.41% 1% low. And the same story again, the average dipped down to 127.4, with the 1% lows creeping up to 86.3. And then Assassin's Creed Valhalla on the custom profile, we saw 110.9 average FPS with a 66.5 1% low. And on the balance profile, the average dipped down to 95.8, and the average on this one also went down to 61. Cyberpunk 2077 then, and in the custom profile, we saw an average FPS of 67 with a 44.9 1% low. In the balance profile, we saw that average go down to 58, and then the 1% low dipped down very, very, very slightly to 43.5. Formula 122 then, and in the custom profile, we saw average FPS readings of 87.4 with a 53.6 1% low. And then on balance, we saw the average FPS dip slightly to 72.7 with a 44.2 1% low. And in Battlefield 2042, on custom profile, we saw an average FPS of 113.2 with a 62.9 1% low. And then on balance, we saw that 94.3 average FPS with a 55.1 1% low. And the final game in our lineup is A Plague Tale Requiem, which on the custom profile achieved 67 average FPS with a 37 1% low. And similar to earlier on, in the balanced profile, we saw a 53.9 average FPS with the 1% low slightly increasing to 39.4. Then finally, to give you a better overall picture of the gaming performance of this laptop, in the custom profile and across the 10 games that I tested, I saw a 96.8 average FPS with a 55.9 average 1% low. And then in balanced profile, we saw 
an 85 average FPS with a 53.9 average 1% low. So in those gaming benchmarks then we can definitely see that this laptop is being held back by that thermal performance. Um, I don't have the equipment to show you the surface temperature of it, but along the top edge underneath the screen, between the top of the keyboard and the bottom of the screen, that piece of metal gets very, very, very hot when it's under heavy strain. Let's move into the thermals, noise and the power usage charts so I can discuss the temperature that this thing reached and the noise that it puts out. Let's kick things off with the CPU temperature chart then. And in the custom profile at idle, I saw temperatures of 55 degrees. In Cyberpunk 2077, I saw that shoot up to 90 degrees. And then in Cinebench, I saw the temperature at around 94 degrees. While in the balance profile, at idle, those temperatures drop by just one degree to 54. In Cyberpunk 2077, they come down by three degrees to 87. But in Cinebench, they drop quite drastically to 68 degrees due to the power limits being placed on the CPU and the massively reduced scores that we saw in the result. That's because it's using less power and the CPU is running at lower clock speeds. Moving on to GPU temperatures then, in the custom profile, I recorded GPU temperatures of 82 degrees, GPU memory temperatures of 94 degrees, and then GPU hotspot temperature of 89 degrees. While in the balance profile, that dipped very, very slightly to GPU of 81 degrees, memory of 93 degrees, and hotspot temps of 87 degrees. And the penultimate chart then, looking at the system noise, in the custom profile, this thing puts out 34 decibels when idle, 52 decibels when running Cinebench Multicore, and 55 decibels when playing Cyberpunk 2077. While in balanced, those figures do drop a little bit. The idle figure stays the same at 34 decibels, but in Cinebench Mortal Core, you see a drastic drop of 39 decibels. And then in Cyberpunk 2077, it's just a two decibel decrease down to 53. And finally then, the CPU package power. I measured this uh, idle in both custom and the balance profile at 15 watts. In Cyberpunk on the custom profile we saw 57 watts. In Cinebench on the custom profile we saw 110 watts. And those figures do come down quite a bit. In Cyberpunk on the balance profile we saw 49 watts of usage. And then in Cinebench on the balance profile we saw 50 watts of usage. So to sum up the review and give you my final thoughts. This laptop, it looks great and it's built very very well. All of the materials used feel really premium. It comes close to feeling as well built as a MacBook. It kind of looks like a black MacBook with a Razer logo on it. But it's all good looking the part. It's got to perform too. And this laptop is hindered quite a lot by some substantial thermal issues, which could be seen by it falling short of the Core i9-13900HX laptop in the benchmarks that are used for comparison. The cooling in this laptop just cannot handle the toasty nature of the processor. There's no point sticking a top spec CPU in a laptop if that laptop cannot keep it cool enough for it to operate at its full potential. Also, aside from that pretty glaring issue, it's so, so, so expensive. There are laptops with equal specs out there for getting close to a grand cheaper than this. That's a massive, massive difference. I could argue that the extra money is for the stellar build quality and materials and that argument would be much easier to put forward if the difference in price wasn't so big and this thing didn't get ridiculously hot. And to finish my sort of compliment sandwich, the screen is very nice. It produces sharp detail and vibrant colours, even for someone who's colourblind like me. The speakers surprised me as well with just how good they sound. For laptop speakers, they sound pretty, pretty good. Overall, I love how the Razer Blade 16 looks, but I cannot recommend it with the thermal throttling I experienced during my testing, especially at £3,600 for this model. If they resolve the cooling issues, then maybe my opinion would change, but until then, if it was me buying a laptop for this amount of money, I'd just look elsewhere. And that's the end of the video, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. Please leave a like down below if you did. Don't forget to subscribe to Kit Guru to keep up with the latest PC gaming news and reviews. If you want to buy any merch of ours, like this t-shirt that I've got on, then you'll find some links just below the video to some of our products. 
And in the video's description, you'll find links to our Patreon page, our Discord server, or our website if you want to go and check any of that out. Anyway, guys, I've been Matt. This has been the very, very toasty, very, very nice looking Razor Blade 16. I will speak to you in the next one. Look after yourselves. See you later.